good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Bali. Also, for the people who are joining us via the live stream, welcome. Uh, good that you're here beside of all the rain that was outside. Um, you're watching the program, the Western Balkans on the European path. Uh, my name is Marlijn Geurt. I'm program editor here at the Bali, and I will moderate the discussion tonight. Um, we organized this program together with the SD, the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats in the European Parliament. And tonight we're going to speak about the six so-called Western Balkan countries, Albania, North Macedonia, Montenegro, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia and Kosovo. And all of these countries have been waiting for years now to enter the European Union. Why is that taking so long and what is the urgency to speak about it right now? And um, even maybe more importantly, what is actually the relation between the Western Balkans and Europe? Uh, we have four fantastic speakers tonight who are going to speak with about it. We have journalist uh, Marjolein Koster, film and theater maker Tia Tupajic, the North Macedonian politician Nikola Dimitrov, and already sitting next to me, Wouter Sweers, research fellow at Klingendau. Great that you're joining us tonight. Um, and I thought maybe as a start, we're speaking about the Western Balkans tonight. Uh, sometimes people also use the Balkans, sometimes they say, South European countries. Yeah. Why are there so many definitions and what's the right one to use? Well, that's a, that's a good question to start with. Um, the Western Balkans is a, is a bit of a political term. And um, sometimes I also hear from people that, from Albania, for example, that they say, well, we never knew that we were part of the Western Balkans until Brussels or Western diplomats told us that we are now classified as. So it's a Brussels term, actually. So it's, it's maybe a little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing is, the strange thing is that when a country becomes a member of the European Union, like uh, Croatia, for example, then suddenly it's not called Western Balkans anymore. So there- but Just so what, maybe, what then you are given the name? So the more neutral term would be simply Southeastern Europe or the Southeastern Europe six, the six that are not yet part of the EU. Okay, okay, then we're going to use. But this. I have yeah. troubled myself too. Okay, and what what term would you normally use yourself? So I often use Western Balkans. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Then for tonight but we're going to use this to term, change. but then we know that there are also <laughs> some critical voices about it, and that that's a Brussels term. Yeah, great. Um, with us tonight, it's also really special. Are the six political ambassadors from the Western Balkans? Uh, give them a very warm welcome. And um, some of you maybe know, but uh, prior to this event right now, there was, were some speed date sessions in the salon uh, next to this venue. Um, and uh, some of uh, you already met those ambassadors, but most of, for most of them, they are maybe new. So I thought it's maybe nice if they can introduce them shortly and maybe say what was the most important thing that they took along from the speed date sessions. Uh, my colleague um, Jolien is there with the microphone, so maybe the first one can start. I think we need a bit, yeah. I can use this microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, can I test this? No. <laughs> <laughs> Mine should work, baby. I'm the I think if you, yeah. Is it working now or not? Yeah. Okay, it's good to know because for the people from the live stream, they can not understand you if it's not via this. Okay. Take my place for now and then, yeah. yeah. <laughs> then we will switch, sorry. <laughs> So uh, my name is Vrandoli, I'm the ambassador of Kosovo. What is my take uh, from the, the uh, speed date is that um, there have been many questions that surprised me, especially about the historical links between the Netherlands and the Western Balkan countries or Southeast European countries. We did our best in explaining uh, parts of our history, parts of our identity, and uh, the means and ways how we see ourselves connected not only with the Western Europe, but also with Europe and European identity. That starts long before, um, uh, or let's say, uh, centuries ago. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, we, have, we have six of them, you know, so we're going to go to the second one. And now the microphone is working. Uh, it's working now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi, good evening, I'm Ksenia, I'm the ambassador of Serbia, and first of all, let me thank you all for taking the time on a Thursday evening, instead of going to some club or some restaurant, to come here and listen about the Western Balkans. That is um, 
uh, a gift to us all because, you know, we very often think that you don't care too much about the region, that you find it too distant, uh, too problematic, too turmoiled, too troublemaking. But the fact that you came is um, uh, really, uh, for me, uh, the impression of the evening and that this is happening um, at all. And I have to say, and of course, uh, thank Thais, our host, who made this all possible tonight. And uh, secondly, uh, to the people who came to the speed dating, because it was very inspirational. And um, whenever we talk to people here in the Netherlands, it doesn't seem that you're as skeptical as we are told you are skeptical. <laughs> so I do hope that we will, in that sense, also make some progress uh, this evening. So thank you again for uh, choosing to spend your Thursday evening uh, with the Western Balkans. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lyubomir Sharjed. I am Ambassador by Diplomatic Rank, but appointed in the Netherlands as Sharjed d'Affaire of the Embassy of Montenegro. I am here accredited as someone who is supposed to uh, work on the technical issues of opening the embassy because Montenegro did not have the embassy uh, uh, so far. So I hope my, my job is uh, getting very close to the finish. I hope within next 30 days, month and a half, uh, we will have officially an, an official address of our embassy in the, in the Netherlands. Thank you for joining us tonight. The speed dating session was fantastic. Uh, uh, I was surprised that a lot of people knew a lot of, a lot of things of, about Montenegro and they actually visited Montenegro. And uh, there, there was n n nothing special that surprised me during, during a, a speed dating session, except one thing that I got a confirmation that Montenegrins are the tallest nation in the world. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Good evening and welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Eva. I'm the deputy ambassador of the of uh, the Republic of Albania um, what uh, struck me to the speed dating was really interesting people that I met in the speed dating and is this um, uh, interest in in our countries and uh, the thirst to know more and this is uh, this is really nice it's quite nice it makes us uh, feel uh, closer <laughs> thank you Okay, thank you very much. I'm uh, Betty Achava. I'm ambassador of North Macedonia here in the Netherlands. I also thank you for being here. Thank you, Thais, for organizing this because there is a feeling, general feeling, I think, among us here that we need uh, to present a little bit more about our region, whether it is called Western Balkans, Southeast Europe, or part of Europe. We all try to become EU member states, and that's our ambition in general. So mostly on that part of speed dating, I spoke with uh, my uh, visitors uh, about the European Union, about the criteria, about the rule of law. And that, that for me is very interesting part uh, that uh, we need to, to discuss with the Netherlands. Because we see the Netherlands in general as a country that is really ruled by law and it's a model country for us. So thank you very much for your interest. Thank you, thank you very much. My name is Almir, Almir Šahović. I'm ambassador of Bosnia and Herzegovina here in the Netherlands. Thank you for organizing this beautiful evening. I think this is an excellent opportunity for all of us to share a little bit about our countries. Concerning the speed dating that I had, I was very impressed by the knowledge of my interlocutors concerning Bosnia. Not general knowledge, but knowledge about our constitutional system, about uh, our history, about Dayton history, about Dayton agreement, etc. And of course, I, I could also remark very big support for Bosnia and Herzegovina EU. Pet. Also, we were speaking a little bit about our beautiful nature, about possibility of 
for, for the Dutch people for coming for skiing in Bosnia and Herzegovina, etc. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm sure that for the people who missed the speed dating, are super curious. Maybe you can do it after the event as well, because they will hang around here and you can have a drink with them. Um, I think they touched upon a certain things that we're going to talk about. Um, but first, we're going to go uh, listen to Nikola Dimitrov, who will introduce tonight's discussion via Zoom. Because for the people who noticed, uh, Radmila Sekirinska would be here tonight. But unfortunately, she had to cancel her participation last minute. Um, but we have a great replacement, uh, because Nikola Dimitrov is a politician from North Macedonia. He is the former Deputy Prime Minister for European Integration, and he also served as the Macedonian Minister of Foreign Affairs from 2017 until 2020. So during his career, he has been very much involved with the European integration of the region. Uh, welcome, Nikola. Do you hear me? Yeah, I hope that we hear him. Always. Yes, I can hear yeah. you loud and clear. Uh, hello. Are you in North Macedonia right now? Yes, I'm in Skopje in my office. Yeah. And is it raining just as much as in the Netherlands right now? It's been a lovely spring sunny day. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> and then you're the lucky one. Um, yeah. <laughs> we ask you to introduce tonight's team. Um, so it's a bit digital, but uh, I will luckily give the floor to you. Do. So, please share your ideas with us. <laughs> yes. Since I am uh, zooming in, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to be telegraphic to keep it interesting. I just want to greet your audience. Who uh, the I have a special relation with the Netherlands because I served as an ambassador at the Hague, and then I stayed on for uh, for a few years. So, the Netherlands is a home away from home. Uh, for me, and what we actually need in our region is a bit of Dutchness, especially the, the level of organization and, uh, you know, a society governed by, by the rule of law, where everyone is equal, uh, before the law, before the courts. Um, I'm going to talk about three things. First, uh, about the time that we have lost. Second, about why I believe Europe also needs its southeastern part. And three, maybe what can be done about it, so the solution. Now, um, we uh, are a region that was promised uh, EU membership as big as 2000, uh, and in particular in 2003, two decades ago, in the uh, Thessaloniki European Council Summit, where uh, it was said that uh, there is European perspective for the countries in our region. <clears throat> our region is encircled by member states. All around us, we have the blue European flag with the yellow stars. So in some ways, we are a gray zone. We are in the same boat economically. We trade with the EU. About three quarters of the trade of the region is with the EU. Similarly, about three quarters of the foreign investment in the region comes from uh, companies from the member states of the EU. And uh, the hope of the people of the region is that one day we're going to be uh, EU member states. Now, we don't have much to show in terms of results for this last 20 years. Croatia joined, the last country that joined the EU in 2013. This year they make one decade since they joined. My own country, uh, North Macedonia, became a candidate country in 2005, we were kept in the waiting room, not because we didn't want to uh, work at home on reforms or fight corruption. There was a dispute with our neighbors in the South, Greece. We solved this dispute with the PRESPA agreement, promises were made, uh, and there was a delay of several years, and now we have a different challenge with neighboring Bulgaria, another EU member state. 
I am one of those who think that the goal of this journey is not simply to join the family, but it is to use the process to transform your country using the uh, feedback, the expertise, the monitoring, the assessment of the European Commission and the member states. The Netherlands is in particular interested in accountability and rule of law. And the Dutch foreign ministry some years ago started a rule of law network. They have legal experts in all of the Dutch embassies in the region. The Dutch approach to this process is strict and fair. And I, I very much like this approach because it should be about whether we deliver. And once we deliver, the EU should reciprocate. It should also uh, deliver. The enlargement process of Europe uh, started with the fall of the Berlin Wall, of course. There was enthusiasm about the uni unifying the European continent. This faded away over, over the years. There was some skepticism in, in some member states. And uh, we uh, sort of have a process now that started as a process with ambition. We're going to help them reform and they will become part of us which turned, so from the perspective of the region, this process was seen as a stairway to heaven, to use the title of a rock song. Uh, nowadays, the region is losing trust that this is actually possible. Not only governments, but more importantly, the people uh, of the region. And to some, the process of accession looks a bit more like a road to nowhere, to use another uh, title, title of a rock song. Now, um, we live in geopolitical times. We have uh, a genocidal war, uh, a Russian aggression uh, against Ukraine. We all feel the consequences in, in many ways. And I think this context calls for leadership, not to overlook uh, the deficiencies of, of our countries, but to become serious and ambitious about uh, the future of the continent. When there is war, it is good to uh, consolidate, it is good to help the victim, and to sanction the aggressor. And at the same time, this consolidation means that um, we should see how we can cover this gray zone of relatively weak institutions and problematic governance and make it more like the rest of the continent. Um, I think for this, we need self-confidence, we need boldness, we need courage and we need vision. Uh, uh, and in, in, in some ways what the region needs and I think what Ukraine needs because the expectation gap between what the Prime Minister of Kiev said he said I think we will join the EU in the next couple of years by contrast the French President Macron says this will be a very lengthy process it may take three decades it may take four decades so the expectation gap is already visible. So uh, what Europe does in our region that was promised membership a long time ago, that is in the process for a long time ago, that is encircled by member states, which will very much resonate in Ukraine. In these geopolitical times, we have competitors, uh, Moscow, does not really have a credible alternative to the European family to offer to the region. They're interested in uh, having a role of a spoiler. And spoiling, preventing successes and creating failures is a narrative that then they use in their uh, neighborhood. Um, the Russian narrative is that the West 
cannot be trusted. They talk nice, uh, they come and visit, they have well-organized summits, but when it comes to delivering, uh, they will fail you. And I think we have uh, a lot of work to do in this. My own country being uh, a veteran country, of a veteran candidate country, we have perfected become, being a, a veteran country. We signed the Association and Stabilization Agreement before Croatia. Croatia is now already in, as I said, for 10 years. And we are sort of now starting accession talks. So I think what we need in these times is uh, to call a spade a spade, to be honest, to offer what the EU can realistically do with this region. Some member states at the moment, France for one, Count Chancellor Scholz of Germany in the last year, year and a half says, enlargement is about our stability. Uh, we cannot tackle uh, illegal migration, small arms, uh, trafficking in people, widespread corruption and organized crime, climate change, any of our challenges, if we don't have this region governed as we are governed. Uh, but uh, we cannot really take new members until we change the decision making on the inside. So uh, they're afraid that uh, if these countries, six countries of the Western Balkans join the EU now under these rules, the decision-making, the efficiency, the like-mindedness of the family might be uh, under risk because on the inside already their rule of law challenges and some countries, Hungary for instance, is uh, quite a challenge when it comes to sanctions against Russia and uh, other, uh, other issues. So I think we need a realistic offer that there will be an incentive on our way to full membership. I, I also think that we need a time frame. Uh, and I think we need an extremely strict and fair assessment of what the EU is about, and the EU is about free media and human rights and rule of law and fighting corruption and organized crime, and this is uh, what we need. Meritocracy as opposed to uh, partocracy, and I, as a citizen of, of the Balkans and as a European, I believe that this actually is the number one challenge of our region. We don't have much time, because people join the EU on their own, individually and their families. And I think we have to really take this uh, process more seriously, not at the expense of reforms, no shortcuts, but make this process real. Uh, it's really difficult as of late to win elections in the countries of our region on a pro-European ticket because the credibility is, is, is falling. In my own country, North Macedonia, uh, about 12% believe that we may join the EU in the next five years. Two years ago, this number was up to 40%. If when citizens are asked is the EU fair, 65% say the EU is unfair and uh, uh, it's about blackmails. And so uh, I think we have to really get to the bottom of what, what European means. I am one of those who think that this world is about decency, about rules, about justice. And I think we have to make this uh, back at the heart of, of the accession process. This is possible, and I think times uh, such as this demand uh, leaders with a vision, because 
If Europe cannot make a difference in a region that is part of its geography, it will really not make a difference in uh, globally. And, and we live in a world that is becoming bipolar gradually. We are all in, in, in transition. For us Europeans to have a voice in this world to come, we need to get uh, our act together. I was trying to be slightly more optimistic. I think I failed at that. Uh, but I, I just want to underscore, let's say, the mood of the people in, in, in Southeastern Europe, including in my own country, in, uh, North Macedonia. We like the Dutch. We have many Dutch tourists in Ohrid. Uh, I think the biggest group, the biggest nation of tourists in Ohrid are still uh, people from, from the Netherlands. We are a country that has no sea, but we have lakes and mountains. We have great wine. So for those in the audience that have not visited, come to North Macedonia and the whole region. It's a beautiful region that lacks uh, good governance. And there is huge demand for that. And I think in this uh, next few years, we can make it right with uh, your help, and it's going to be a win-win for the continent. I'll stop here because I promised I'm going to be <laughs> like graphic and short. Yeah. Not exactly, but I was not too long. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um... Thank you so much. You shared a lot uh, that we're going to discuss, but maybe um, one extra question uh, following your speech. Um, if uh, our Prime Minister Mark Rutte would sit here with me at the table tonight, what would you ask him? I know Mark personally, mm -hmm. Prime, Minister, Prime Minister Rutte. Yeah, but maybe not in a private setting, but in an official setting as we are sitting here. What would you, what would you ask him to do? Like, what is, you're speaking about leadership, and that uh, yes. these times ask for great leadership. What should he do according to you? I think... There were two major, uh, how do I put this nicely? Let's say misfortunes with my own country. We solved the biggest problem with our neighbor, Greece. We toppled a leader that was, an, that was becoming an autocrat. And we really started moving forward. What was missing in EU's approach towards North Macedonia was the fair part. Mm -hmm. from the strict and fair. And this momentum was initially completely undermined by France in 2019, when North Macedonia was blocked not so much about us, but because of another country in the region. And there was a debate along these lines in the Fedekammer. And this paved the way for neighboring Bulgaria to come up with preconditions that have nothing to do about democracy and rule of law and free media, but about history and identity. So being strict and fair is not only about blocking countries because they don't fight corruption enough, but it's also about blocking fellow member states to misuse the EU to pursue agendas that are fundamentally not European. Yeah. And at the moment, our neighbor and member state, Bulgaria, has issues with our language, the Macedonian language. They say this is a dialect, it's not really a language. This is obviously detrimental to our friendship, to our future, and it's really offensive to the ethnic Macedonians in, in North Macedonia. So, if you're strict and fair, you have to also stand up to those who are misusing the process and making a ridicule of the European narrative in a region that is hungry for Europe. This is what I will tell Mark, it's a bit of a long story, but I will yeah. tell him, fight for standards when they work for you, but also when it's less opportune, you have to stick to standards and principles. It's a, a great answer. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes, Wouter, uh, I'm going to you because um, we heard a lot. Um, and also a bit of like, a, it's a really timely moment. Uh, a lot has to happen in the coming two years. Um, are you sharing the optimism, pessimism from Nikola Dimitrov? Well, I'm sharing many of the things that he has said. I mean, in the process is taking a long time. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe we should have been a bit wary already in 2003, because at that summit in Thessaloniki, yeah. the European perspective was promised. And I'm, since we were already discussing terminology er er mm -hmm. earlier, I don't really know what European perspective means. The, the region is in Europe, so I would rather say we need an EU perspective mm -hmm. for these countries. Um, but um, I think that um, I'm, I'm slightly optimistic. I try to be optimistic, but I notice amongst experts, amongst diplomats, amongst uh, citizens uh, in the region as well, that there is the, the enlargement fatigue. It mm -hmm. has its own terminology now as well. So um, there, 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 something needs to change to become more optimistic again and to make the process work. And I think Nicola touched upon one of these core problems and uh, are one of the characteristics of the process, and that is that the EU member states are in the driving seat. Mm -hmm. uh, the European Commission administers the pro process uh, on a daily basis, but it's the member states that can make the decision, is a candidate ready for the next step to, uh, well, it's, it's a bit of a technical process, but to open a new negotiating chapter or whatsoever. Um, so this is something that we should discuss in the next years. Is this really the way to go forward? And how can we prevent member states from blocking the process uh, for reasons that have nothing to do with the actual criteria? Yeah, and is this a recent problem or is it, has it always been like this? That, like, that there was so much power in the hands of maybe the member states who can block this? I think... It has always been like this, although uh, as the process has become more stretched, there, has, there have also become more opportunities for member states to, to uh, have their veto on, uh, on progress. So it, it, the problem has become somewhat larger over the years, I would say. Yeah, yeah. and um, we were speaking about strict and fair. Yeah. If you think about the whole integration process and how this process is going, is it a fair system? It's the democratic system, maybe. Well, um, I mean, the process is meant to have countries join the European Union in a way that it strengthens both these countries and the EU as well. I think the process is not, as Nicola also said, it's not only about the accession, it's also about the transformation. Yeah. So in a certain way, the strict part is simply necessary to make sure that uh, when it comes to the democratic values when it comes to the rule of law, that these reforms have really taken place before a country can join the EU. Um, because also when we look at the current geopolitically challenging times, then you see that countries that have, um, uh, well, uh, are not yet fully democracies or that still have some problems when it comes to the independence or the, of the judiciary or whatsoever, that, um, that also, uh, opens up possibilities for foreign actors, for countries to also meddle in their domestic systems and to also geopolitically influence them. So I think for the EU and the, the candidates it's necessary to be strict in a way, but indeed the fair part needs to be there as well. And when it comes to the case of North Macedonia, it's certainly, uh, I fully agree that uh, the blockade that we've seen first from Greece, now from Bulgaria is not fair. So. Yeah. And um, because in, on, like, in some way the EU has to argue why they are still not part of it. Yeah. They use certain arguments for it, right? Yeah, in a way, yes. And, and uh, the credibility of the EU is at stake there because, of yeah. course, the EU itself is far from perfect. And we see rule of law deterioration in some of our own member yeah. states. So, and yeah. if, you think, if you listen to this argumentation, like, is there any valid things that they are saying about it? Or is it just random in a way because it feels a bit like that they are some like macedonia is then meeting the criteria but they are still being blocked um, um, how can the eu just argue for that still yeah I'm, I'm not sure whether it's random sometimes it does sound a bit empty i mean yeah. if european commission president von der leyen has this uh yeah habit of saying the western balkans are part of europe part of our 
EU family, their, their future lies with us. And at a certain point, if you repeat that time after time, but we do not see that progress happening, then it becomes a bit of an empty or a hollow phrase. So. Yeah, yeah. And um, how much does it have to do with, like you're speaking about um, mem the countries that are member, yeah. uh, and if you think about their rule of law, about certain issues that they're playing in these countries, um, they are dealing with that as well, but they are a member. Is yeah. it actually the experience with the, uh, the integration of these kind of um, countries um, that these new countries that want to be part of uh, the EU are a bit of victim of? Because that there's o those earlier experiences maybe influence why they're maybe hesitant to for the entrance of new countries. Well, s certainly so. I think in, in the Netherlands, maybe especially, um, we, we've seen a number of crises in the EU, um, starting with the Euro crisis mm -hmm. and uh, migration or, or migration management crisis, I think we can better say, and the rule of law deterioration in some certain member states. And that has really made people feel they are, uh, well, maybe losing a bit of a sense of control Mm -hmm. um, over the Netherlands, feeling that Brussels is not in control of what's going on uh, within the EU. So I, I think that has had a negative effect on uh, on the candidate countries. At the same time, the sort of two crises that we've seen most recently, first the Brexit, the UK mm -hmm. leaving, well, I, I think we all can all see that that's had, had, that hasn't really played out well for them. So maybe that crisis, and then now the much bigger crisis, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that also shows um, that we actually need each other and that we maybe do need to stick together. So I think, um, yeah, rule of law deterioration has had, had a, have a negative uh, effect, but then these final two crises maybe also have shown that we actually do need to tackle these challenges that not only the EU is facing, but Europe at large, when it comes to security, when it comes to climate as well, when it comes to fighting disinformation, that uh, that needs to be tackled on the adequate level. And for me, it's very clear that that is both the EU and the candidate countries in the Western Balkans. Yeah, all together, yeah. The region at large, yeah. Um, and you say it's, according to me, very urgent. Uh, I see a lot of reasons to really uh, speed up the process. Um, if you just look at the process itself, is it now higher on the agenda with Ukraine? Uh, do you see uh, acceleration of the process? Well, what we saw with Ukraine is that uh, it was not the case that some steps were simply sidelined. So um, the process as it was designed was followed, but in a much quicker way. So normally if a country would apply first for EU membership, uh, and then the first step is to obtain this candidate status, then it can take quite a while before the European Commission makes a first assessment of whether a country meets some of the, the, the first criteria, so to say. And then it can take quite a while for the EU to make this decision mm -hmm. uh, to make a country an actual candidate. We've seen that Bosnia only got this candidate status last year. Yeah. Um, so with Ukraine, these steps were followed, um, but in, and with Moldova as well, but in a much quicker way. And um, I, I don't see too much room for sidelining some of the steps or sidelining some of the criteria. As I said, I think it's still very important also for the strength of the EU itself to make sure that countries that do join the EU uh, meet these criteria. Um, but in terms of attention for EU enlargement and uh, thinking not only of EU enlargement as a sort of separate policy issue, but integrating that thinking uh, with the thinking about the future of the EU, the political order in Europe at large, I think that w is certainly something that, that can be done in the next years. And we see now some first signs of that. Yeah, and do you also see that uh, the process, that there's more attention? Uh, you're now speaking about Ukraine and about Moldova, mm -hmm. but does it also influence uh, the candidate status of the uh, Western Balkan countries? Um, in a way, uh, in a way, yes. In a way, so, uh, for for some part, uh, it, it affects it positively because there's simply more attention for the issue of EU enlargement as such, and also uh, there's a realization that it's also a geopolitical necessity mm -hmm. uh, and the right thing to do to work on on integrating the region. Um, in 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 a way, um, I think um, it's also. How do I put this? It's also, um, yeah, if it's only for geopolitical reasons that we now realize, hey, we need to, to actually pay more attention, mm -hmm. then it's also not the way to go, I think. So it has, it has a different effect. Uh, why not? It's 
Well, because there are many other reasons which Nicola also touched upon why I think, uh, um, and, and as I just said, like the, the, the challenges that the Europe faces, we need to tackle them at an at adequate level. And I think that, that is more than just the geopolitical challenges. It's also the climate issue where we really need the, the countries in Southeast Europe to to be on board and, and to work with them. And I think we can, we can all isolate our houses here in the Netherlands, but if we want to be efficient, let's first work on uh, energy issues in the Western Balkans and look at the, the coal uh, power plants, for example, that, that there are still there, as in the rest of Europe, but in the region, some are particularly uh, outdated and polluting. So these are things require sort of uh, yeah, uh, a, a common approach. Yeah, and um, if we're thinking about a couple of years, I, I don't want to put a number on it because I think nobody exactly knows, but suppose that all the Western Balkan countries would be part of the EU. Yeah. How would it change maybe the EU itself or the identity of the EU? Would it really have an effect, you think? I, I think there would be an effect on the political dynamics. We now see a, a sort of a domination of this French-German axis, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, maybe Western European countries in general that are still somewhat dominant in the in the EU uh, in the EU debates of course the political um, yeah the political center of the EU would shift somewhat to the right but in, when it comes to the functioning of the EU I mean we are now already 27 member states it's it's difficult sometimes to reach uh, agreement on especially issues that require uh, unanimity. But then whether we are 27 or 28 or 29 or in the end even uh, 35, 36, I, I don't think that provides uh, much difference. At the same time, um, this prospect of new countries joining could be a reason to, to look at what things are going wrong in the EU at this point and try to make some reforms that maybe we should already make uh, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nicola, since you're still with us, um, I have maybe a last question for you because I think you had to go to a TV interview. Um, if I would ask you how far should North Macedonia go to get the EU membership, what would your answer be? How far? Yeah, how far? Because uh, maybe not everybody knows, but during your time as a uh, foreign minister, uh, for, uh, minister of foreign affairs, um, you were actually, uh, the name of your country has changed um, from Macedonia to North Macedonia. This is quite a, a change that you made uh, or that your country made. So, like, um, if, if Europe is coming up with new criteria the whole time, how far, like, where does it, where does it end for you? If, if I would ask you that question personally. Yeah, I'll say, I'll say two things. First, to directly respond to the question. Um, I, I believe in this Prespa agreement, because uh, Greece was about distinction. We want, this is our Macedonia, this is your Macedonia. Mm -hmm. For us, it was about identity. We are now North Macedonia, but the majority of the people living there are still Macedonians who speak the Macedonian language. And this Greece accepted. What I cannot accept as a European living in 21st century, right, 2023, is that my language is, uh, you know, a subject of negation and, and a country in this civilization says your language is not real language, which is what Putin says about Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. Ukraine is a mistake of history, a creation of Lenin. We are also a mistake of history, a creation of Tito. I think this is not decent. And it is not proper. And as a person, I think I have quite an issue with this. So if Europe is Europe, if the, if the Union is really European, we should fight this. And I look forward to having a European Bulgaria that will accept a basic right of its neighbor to say who, who they are. So for me, uh, I would uh, do everything that I can to get my nation into the EU. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I'm going to continue to be a Macedonian who will join the EU. If the price is uh, 
my language and my my dignity i think this is this in a way undermines the eu as well because we say eu is a community of values then we have to live up to it and second because brexit was mentioned and i'm going to end with this Walter mentioned Brexit. I was asked once at, a, at an interview in London, why do you want to join where we are living? Mm -hmm. And I said, look, for those of you who have been on the inside for a long time, you tend to forget how cold it is outside. <laughs> I, I don't know whether they are realizing, uh, you know, the, the, the weather difference, the temperature difference. <laughs> now that they're out, uh, but uh, we, I, I think, even over glorify the, you know, because we mm -hmm. are on the outside and, and I sometimes catch myself thinking in, in those terms. At the same time, we have a lot of things to look up to in societies like the Dutch society, and, and several others, you're a good example, and we need your friendship and assistance to make it. Yeah. And if we make it, you will be stronger. And, and I think this is, what is this about? Yeah. Thank you so much for, for having me. Yeah, thank you for being here with us tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's a good time to open up the conversation uh, because we are now speaking a little bit, uh, a lot about geopolitical and really from a policy making level, mm. uh, but we are also dealing with cultures, different cultures, different people, and uh, maybe some EU fa fatigue was already a term mentioned. Um, so I would like to invite two uh, extra people to the table, uh, Thea Tupajic, uh, a film and theater maker and journalist Marjolein Koster. Please welcome. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you uh, for being here. Uh, Marjolein, I would like to start with you because you're a journalist uh, specialized in the Western Balkans, uh, maybe the only ju Dutch journalist fully specialized in the Western Balkans. Um, where did your journey start? Like, why did you get interested in this region? Mm. Um, well, it started actually when I was on a holiday. Uh, I did an interrail trip, just as a lot of young European people do. Um, and I just thought, these countries, I think this first time I visited Serbia, uh, Croatia, I mean, we can debate if it's Western Balkans, uh, and Bosnia, and I just felt like these countries are so beautiful, um, the people are so nice, why don't I know more about this, um, and why are there no journalists here? Mm -hmm. While there's such a recent history, uh, which is still very much affecting everybody's daily lives, um, I also thought these re this region will be uh, more in the picture probably, mm -hmm. not only because they are in the process uh, for becoming the European Union, but also because um, I think you can say all of them are like new, yeah, they are new countries, so they are still developing. So uh, from a journalistic point of view, that was also really interesting for me. Um, and then I just stick to it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, the first time that you went there, um, what were your expectations and was it really different than you thought? Because maybe that's the bit of the human thing that we're speaking about, yeah. that people don't know a lot about the region. Well, I I don't know. I have no idea what my expectations were. Uh, how long ago was this? Maybe that's good to, well, to say. Um, over 10 years, okay. I think. Yeah. Um, but one thing that I do remember is that I noticed that, yes, the region is different from what we are used to in Netherlands. There is a different culture. But at the same time, it's not so different that you cannot really feel at ease or like that. Um, and for me personally, that was also one of the reasons why I kept going there, because um, the people are really friendly, and I do feel we have some sort of shared history, you know. I mean, I remember being there uh, in, in Sarajevo and going to the place where the First World War started. I mean, we, we, think, we tend to forget that, but mm -hmm. it is a shared history that we have. And yes, there are differences, uh, differences in mentality, in the food, in the music, in the culture, but I do think there's also a lot of um, uh, similarities. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Thea Tupaj, 
Thank you very much for being here as well. Um, you're a filmmaker, theater maker, born in Bosnia. You grew up in uh, Croatia uh, and you live here now. Um, if you introduce yourself and people ask where you're from, what do you actually say? Do you say then, I'm Bosnian, I'm Yugoslavian, I'm European, I'm... Uh, well, uh, I, I also grew up in Bosnia, uh, but I say, <clears throat> like it's complicated with our nationalities, but since uh, I have a Croatian nationality, uh, so uh, I say that I'm Croatian. Yeah. Yeah. And do you, do you hate the question? It's because actually, we maybe? don't, um, I don't think that in our countries we don't really actually have this luxury. Like I noticed that in Western Europe somebody says, uh, or in America they say, um, I'm American, but actually I'm Norwegian. We don't have that luxury in our region. You have to say what your nationality are. Yeah. It's not that I can think that I'm this or that. Yeah. Um, and how did you both listen to the conversation so far? Was there anything you wanted to react to or maybe add something to? Because a lot of has been said. I would like to start with you, Tia. Yeah. Uh, well, I would. Um, I, I was surprised to hear uh, when you said something uh, that, that you traveled uh, to the region, and then, um, like you said, but we have many similarities. We, the Dutch, uh, many similarities with the people there. Like we tend to forget. And that that that, uh, that surprised me. Uh, <laughs> I think we don't have similarities. No, I, I do think that. Well, uh, no, but this part of uh, like we tend to forget. Um, but th this is one thing that I always forget it's in in regards to this question of uh, how does Europe perceive the Western Balkans, whether uh, how we perceive ourselves. Uh, I always uh, uh, also tend to forget uh, that the audio, uh, that the Europe um, tends to forget <laughs> the uh, similarities or differences between us. So yeah, I think we even a lot of times forget that these countries are part of Europe. I mean, so many times we speak about. I mean, we in general, as people in the Netherlands, we speak about Europe, and then we actually mean European Union. Mm -hmm. You know, we really forget that these countries are still there and that they are uh, part of Europe and of European history. So you, you saw it also with the, the start of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and then in all the media had said the first large war in Europe since the Second World War, and then I think quite well, hopefully, quite some people thought, well, no, <laughs> it's. We have had an, uh, another quite a big uh, war in the 1990s in our own continent. So, yeah. Yeah, or for example, um, I think um, many of my Bosnian Dutch friends were quite offended when uh, Mark Rutte said we are celebrating 75 years of, uh, of freedom in Netherlands. Um, when was it? Like a few years back. And there's a lot of um, Bosnian people in the Netherlands, a, lo a lot of people from former Yugoslavia who are like, okay, but am I not, am I not Dutch? Because I, I haven't experienced that freedom in Europe. Mm -hmm. And of course, people are not um, doing that on purpose. At least I hope they are not doing it on purpose. I just think it's not part of our, um, of our com yeah, we just don't think of, of it, unfortunately. And I mean, I do see that also as a, uh, like a task of me as a journalist mm -hmm. to, to get more attention for the region and to... Um, to is it hard to it. get actually... Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah? And do you... Is it, is it changing over the years that you're focusing as a journalist on that region? Um, well, the sad part is that um, there is a tension if there's some something bad going on. So mm -hmm. always when there is some sort of... Um, uh, like a rise, uh, like there could be a, a conflict, for example. I mean, we we keep saying that all the time, all the time, and sometimes that tension rises a bit, and then uh, then yes, it's easy to get um, to get some attention to that. Uh, but otherwise, I would say it's quite challenging. I do think that um, I, I would say I'm quite persistent, mm -hmm. and it does work a little bit. Um, but I would also like to um, comment a bit on the previous uh, yeah. conversation, if that's okay. Um, I mean, it has been mentioned already, the strict and fair, which I learned actually there's a third word to it, strict, fair and engaged. What was it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, we'll see about that. Um, I mean, there's a lot of politicians in here who might 
have to be diplomatic in what they say, but I, I'm you really... You don't have to, so... Uh, I don't have to say what you want. <laughs> I think the European Union and the Netherlands, especially together with France, they have really not been fair, not only in the North Macedonia uh, issue, but also towards Albania. You know, tying Albania to North Macedonia, well, they should just receive their own process. Um, uh, Kosovo, for example, they have been waiting for um, uh, the visa liberalization. So... Still, people from Kosovo have to apply for a visa to get to other European countries. Mm -hmm. um, they promise it will be, I mean, now actually they will have it, I think, uh, next year. But since 2018, they have met the criteria and they were waiting all the time for, about this. Um, another example, when um, we just had uh, some major negotiations between uh, Serbia and Kosovo. Mm -hmm. And although these negotiations were not about uh, Serbia recognizing Kosovo, it was about um, a normalization of relation. But we still have countries within the European Union that do not recognize Kosovo. So how can you expect to lead this negotiation while well, actually you are not being on the same page as a European Union? Um, so yeah, I do think European Union should change that. <laughs> yeah. Um, Tia, I was actually wanted to ask you because, uh, like, only last year, um, Bosnia was getting the first candidate status uh, thing. Were you actually happy about that? Was that news doing anything to you? Uh, well, uh, it, it <laughs> uh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, I mean, well, we don't want to. Um, I would not like to. How, how do you say? Um, the not accept the the, um, the hospitality. But the thing is that um, maybe it's in me, in me personally, but I can also uh, mm -hmm. notice uh, with many people and also of my generation that the hope uh, is actually uh, uh, very tiny and also based on the experience uh, of uh, of other countries. That um, yes, well. Uh, it, it, it never uh, s seems like a really realistic possibility. Mm -hmm. yeah. And is it a, a common shared uh, feeling? Uh, I don't know. Is it is it uh, is it just me personally mm -hmm. uh, that that has a very little hope? But I can uh, I can notice I can also notice it with other people as well. Yeah. yeah. Are you like maybe you know? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's a, a common sh feeling. Absolutely. Uh, I think you can also see it in the numbers. I think also uh, Nicola, uh, Nicola Dimitrov also mentioned mm -hmm. it, you know, that the percentage of people that actually have trust that they will join in the coming years or whatever. Um, but also uh, when the Bosnia got the candidacy uh, last November, I think it was, mm -hmm. I felt like, okay, I'm going to congratulate my friends, you know. I, but everybody was like, yeah, yeah, thank you, but we know it will never happen. It's really like how many people feel it. Like it, it's, it's difficult to keep hope if you get disappointed many times. And how do they then look, or how do you look, at uh, uh, politicians who are still trying for that? Because there's a lot of attention or a lot of energy um, put into it. Uh, but maybe the people are thinking, yeah, just put your energy somewhere else. Maybe the EU candidate status is not something we have to strive for. Uh, you mean uh, politicians from the Western Balkans? Yeah. Or? Well, I, I don't think I'm the one who should say what these politicians should do. But I no, do. but I mean yeah, like yeah. the people there and how are they yeah. relating to the politicians from their countries who are maybe putting a lot of energy into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, as, been, as has been mentioned before, I do think that uh, a lot of these, uh, th lot of these requirements uh, could also be good for the country. So, mm -hmm. of course, there is some. Um, I, I think it's good that they should continue, um, but I think at the same time there should also be change something from the European side. I'm not saying they should just let them join. Mm -hmm. uh, but there has to change something in the dynamic in order to get at least to get the Western Balkans back on board. And I'm not, per definition, maybe the politicians, because I do see a lot of, most of the politicians are still very much pro-EU, and the people are as well. But 
I really think there needs to change something in order to, um, <laughs> I don't know, to get energy instead of fatigue. Um, I mean, we, we've talked a bit, uh, quite a bit now also about the, the flaws that we see within the EU when it comes to mm -hmm. the approach to the region and, and, and the problems in enlargement. And I think it's f fair to say and, and to discuss these flaws because there are, there are quite some. Um, when it comes to, we, well, we shortly touched upon the role of the Netherlands. I think if you look at all the EU member states and how they're involved in the region, I think this, this Dutch motto, strict, fair and engaged, is actually... Uh, the Netherlands is, is sort of trying to, to keep up to that motto uh, with uh, five embassies in the regions, whereas some other northwestern member states only have one, for example, covering the full region. So mm -hmm. I, I do see efforts from the Netherlands as well. Uh, and then the, 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 the question is, okay, why do we have all these delays? Is it because of the EU, yes, it is. But what what else is there, you know? And I do think that if we talk about politicians in the region being motivated and worth putting all their energy into EU enlargement, I'm I'm afraid that that's a bit of a too optimistic uh, description of what's going on. Uh, and unfortunately, we do see that, um, of course, these criteria and these reforms are also so difficult to meet, but we do see that sometimes these reforms have been stalled for a little while, and there are then these independent indicators that say, okay, uh, in terms of democratic reforms, there's actually a standstill or even a little backlash. And then that shows also then that the process of EU enlargement has become a bit a, a de detached from, uh, from actual developments on the ground. Yeah. yeah. TM, do you maybe want to react to that? Are you actually worried about the developments in the Western Balkan? I would uh, like to uh, say something that's yeah. maybe not a direct uh, reaction to this, but uh, if I could have uh, one dream come true for, uh, for myself uh, from uh, the European Union and, um, yeah, from European Union, not Europe, because I also think... Uh, like uh, a colleague said, I think that uh, the Western Balkan and the former Yugoslavia is also Europe. Uh, my opinion is that um, what I would like to see is uh, European Union and Europe acknowledging the fact that uh, what it means to be a European in the 21st century and in the 20th century that is behind us, um, the other second part of the 20th century, that a big part of that experience is also uh, the war uh, and the collapse of the former Yugoslavia because what uh, separates me um, from uh, my peers and also people of a bit different generation from Western Europe, Europeans, is that we have a fundamentally different experience in this lifetime. Uh, Europeans uh, of my generations have uh, experience of, uh, of peace, of stability, and if they have any tragedies in their lives, then those tragedies are personal. Uh, the, um, the history and what it means to come from, from Yugo former Yugoslavia is a completely different experience. And I would really like uh, if... Um, the countries enter European Union, or if um, countries that already are there, Slovenia and Croatia, uh, are to be really integrated into, into Europe, I would like our experience to also be integrated and not always to be uh, a foreign one. And, um, and also, that would mean for Europe also to understand that our war and what happened to us is not something that happened somewhere in the margins, that it's also a part of European history, and uh, in that regard, I think what is necessary for the people of our region uh, would be to, um, on a systematic level, deal with uh, the remnants of uh, trauma and of, um, of the self-esteem, because we cannot enter European Union like some marginalized Balkan people that are begging our way in. I would like us to enter as a, a self-confident people carrying a very important part of the history of Europe yeah. of the uh, second half of 20th century. So, um, Can I ask, uh, do you think there's a lack of um, knowledge and understanding uh, of this history? I think that there is a lack of, we, we can uh, read and talk about it as much as we want, but I think that there is a lack of uh, embodied experience because... Um, European uh, born in the 80s can never understand what it means to be a person from the former Yugoslavia born in the 80s. 
Um, and um, but these differences in embodied experience and history, I think, need to be acknowledged. And the partially um, in the well, sorry to address it like this, but the Europeans, but then partially also, I think what we need to work on uh, in our countries is um, uh, uh, confidence and courage that arises from our experience, rather as always perceiving ourselves as somebody from a margin that is mm -hmm. trying to creep in. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, actually, maybe uh, because you're an artist and uh, you're also sitting here as an artist um, and you made a beautiful documentary film, uh, Darkness There and Nothing More, that premiered at ITFA in 2021. And it actually has to deal with a lot of topics that you just touched up on uh, about the embodied experience of this war, about the differences between people who didn't. Uh, can you maybe tell a bit about um, why did you start with this idea for this film? Where did it start? Because it maybe makes a bit concrete what you just said. Uh, darkness there, yes. So the reason uh, why I came to the Netherlands was the project. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a film. It's called Darkness There and Nothing More. And, well, uh, as uh, some of you uh, maybe know, um, the, in the Netherlands there is a former UN battalion called the Dutch Bat. And this is a a Dutch battalion that was um, uh, sent to peacekeep and uh, Srebrenica and an enclave in Bosnia. Well, unfortunately, genocide happened uh, there. And this project uh, brought me uh, to the Netherlands. And I think also now when I look back, I think it was also from, uh, from my childhood experience, this was my first experience of Europeans. Um, because I didn't, um, growing up in former Yugoslavia, I didn't particularly understand, I mean, I didn't understand what is Europe very much, um, but um, uh, this battalion and also uh, the other battalions, like the French battalion that was in Sarajevo, was my first experience of Europeans that were always uh, coming from somewhere uh, outside to protect us, well, uh, not so much success there. <laughs> Uh, so, um, so yes, and then In Darkness There is a film in which uh, I invite uh, two uh, veterans of the Dutch Bat um, uh, Battalion uh, to spend uh, one night with me uh, in an empty theater. Yeah, maybe um, do we can watch a very short clip that we, it's just a really small uh, short moment. Um, uh, it's, I think, it's Harm, that's the name of the Dutch veteran. Um, I think it's the first clip uh, for the technicians. Can you maybe show that? This is just a very short clip of a much longer film. I would uh, recommend everybody to see it. Um, but it actually makes you a bit more quiet if you if you see this. Um, it's about um, we can maybe show the uh, graffiti that is uh, that you're talking about with this Dutch uh, veteran. I think we also have an image mm -hmm. of that. Um, what did you actually learn from this experience of being there for the whole night? If you think about um, the relationship between the Dutch and Bosnia and about the, 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 the cultural images that are strong or prevalent, maybe? Well, I think that I learned uh, many, uh, well, uh, pretty unfortunate things about uh, this concrete conflict uh, mm -hmm. uh, that we have. Uh, it didn't bring uh, much um, a resolution or comfort that night. Um, but th th that is obvious, and one can also see it from the clip. Uh, but I think that it was in that night that I understood, uh, w w on the example of um, this uh, Dutch battalion, Dutch bat, um, what is the difference uh, between um, uh, them and us, sorry to say it like that, uh, in regards to what I said, uh, coming from a different history. Because there is also another part uh, in, in the film when, when I say to uh, to him, I say, Frank, uh, you know what the difference between you and me is? Uh, you uh, you expect life to be fair, and um, there is this thing, the, this specific, uh, 
you know, if you are born and raised in Europe, then you, they always were expecting that the country will take care of them, that there will be uh, some kind of a, a, a trauma therapist, somebody always, uh, somebody to protect them. Whereas um, uh, coming from the region where I come from is a different experience of being uh, on this planet. But um, but nevertheless, I do still think w what I said before. I think that. Uh, our experience can also strengthen Europe, and I think that Europe should embrace uh, our history as part of their history, yeah. your history. Our, and, how, how shall I say it? Our and, history. <laughs> yeah, and if you think about first steps to to do that, to yeah. uh, what, 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 do you, what are you thinking of? of oh, what I, do you think is needed? I think like this. I think that uh, we, <laughs> uh, the people from um, the, the former Yugoslavia, I think that if we, because we cannot start with Europeans, well, what will they do? I would, if I look at myself personally and that uh, my friends, my family, uh, what do we need to do? Do I think that we need to uh, become uh, more uh, self-aware? I think that we need to um, uh, carry our history and experiences uh, with, with much more courage and pride than we do. Uh, and uh, I think that perhaps if we come with that attitude, uh, things will change. What do we think about that? How can you even answer to this <laughs> or react to it? I just wanted to, while listening to you and also while preparing for this event, I was also thinking about, you know, we speak a lot about uh, what, uh, what the Western Balkans should do to join the European Union and as if it's like the highest goal that they can reach and if it's like an end uh, where they are going to. And also, I mean, um, a lot of people have said, like, we can use some of the European Union, you know, we can use some of the, the, the way how, they, how we put laws, how we are mm -hmm. structured, etc. But I do think we can learn a lot about the Western Balkans and these countries as well. And we, yeah, um, and it's easily to overlook that when we speak about this process. And, um, and it's sad that we see it like that because we shouldn't. I mean, um, as we said in the beginning, there's a lot of differences, but come on, there's also a lot of differences between Sweden and Spain, for example, mm -hmm. you know, and um, let's not look all the time at those differences, but also about what we have in common. How do you maybe listen to that? Because you're all day involved in EU enlargement in policy making, and now yeah. you listen to these two other perspectives. What do you think? Well, in, I, indeed, on a daily basis, I'm dealing with this enlargement methodology and these political mm -hmm. debates and uh, policy making debates. And what, what step is Brussels taking now? How does the Netherlands uh, yeah. feel about it? How does uh, Hungary feel about it, any other member states. And then I listen to you and I hear, uh, well, this story and also like how you basically see, uh, well, uh, the experiences that you had yourself, uh, as we also s just saw in the in the clip from your movie. And then I think it must, for you, it must sound maybe very, a bit, um, distant this whole sort of formal political process and maybe a bit um what's the right word it must uh, it must feel a bit uh, strange to to listen to that uh, indeed as if it's uh, because it's in a way it's a bit of an e uneven relationship mm -hmm. you know in the succession process there is the member states that are in and that can put demands on the yeah. table and then at a certain uh, and then the candidate basically needs to meet these demands in order to progress. So it is a bit of an uneven relationship, and that must um, that must feel very maybe difficult for you. Uh, well, actually, um, I'm surprised that it doesn't. But you know why it doesn't? Because I um, actually it should, uh, but it doesn't because we have this history of a uh, Dayton Agreement. And so I don't know, like I got a little bit used to that uh, always some, you know, uh, somebody comes and says you have to do like this or like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, I actually now when you say it, I'm aware that yes, it should feel uncomfortable <laughs> for me. <Yeah. laughs> thank you for, <laughs> thank you for making all the time and also, you know, the Dayton Agreement and then also uh, the Hague Tribunal, so I'm so used to uh, hearing of uh, about us from somewhere from another country, how we are, what we should do, where are we at? Um, yeah. yeah. 
Um, I, yeah, I would maybe also uh, would like to open up to the floor because there are maybe people who want to join in or to have a question for each of you, one of you. But maybe uh, first, Marjolein, uh, quick reaction and then we go to the audience. Yeah. There's still like 20 things yeah. I want to say. <laughs> uh, one, uh, two things. Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, one about the Dayton Peace Agreement, which I think is a perfect example of how the European Union or, or international community in general is still uh, very much influencing the region and the mm -hmm. dynamics in the region. And and uh, whether we like it or not, uh, we are partly responsible for that. So, yeah, we should also be part of the solution because it's at this moment, it, um, it's a, there's a lot of problems because of that. And also I was thinking, okay, what could the EU do different in this whole process? I think there's one example um, uh, from Serbia. We speak a lot about the influence of Russia in Serbia mm -hmm. lately. Uh, which I think is important, but in this whole uh, debate, we sometimes forget that Russia is um, economically wise, like a very small uh, player in Serbia. The EU, on the other hand, both in terms of trade and investments, are huge. But both the people in Serbia don't really realize that, and also we as Europeans don't really realize that. And I think there, the European Union could maybe do a bit bit better in marketing, like showing what they do in the region, because people hardly know. Yeah. That's what I wanted to add. Yeah, very important. Um, I look at Jolene, maybe if you have a question, you can raise your hand and then she's coming with the microphone so that people who listen from home can also hear it. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, actually, I have a, a question for uh, all the six ambassadors we have here. We're all sitting here, so I thought we might as well ask them some questions uh, instead of just uh, listening. I mean, I would like to hear from all of you, would you rather have that you would join the EU as a bloc together, or would you say, listen, we all have our own path, and you know, once we fulfill all the cri criteria, we will join. So uh, maybe you want to yeah. reflect. Uh, we have six of them, so how are we going to make this short? <laughs> um, maybe really quickly, because I'm, it's a curi I'm curious about the answer. Thank you. First of all, we would like to join. So this is the, uh, the response. Um, I'm not sure I can answer very briefly on that, but uh, uh, accession process is merit-based process. So each country on its own merit. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. It's a very, very good question. I think that there are, there are two elements. The first element is, like Betty has just said, the accession process is a merit-based process. But from the point of view of the interest of the region and of the stability, and uh, when we think about our recent history, I think that the best solution would be if there is a possibility for the whole of the region to join together. Yeah. Thank you. Is there maybe with an, somebody with a different opinion or something to add? Because that's maybe a good question to ask. Well, you know, it's one of those questions where whatever you answer, it's a wrong answer. You know, <laughs> so I mean, it's, but. Um, if I, uh, if I tell you that uh, I would prefer that we join uh, individually as we, I mean, merit-based, um, then, you know, it might be the wrong answer uh, because uh, it might take the next 20 years for all of us to join for different reasons. If I say we should join and block those who are more advanced uh, than the others, you know, like Montenegro, my colleague here, for example, could say that they need to wait for, you know, the, the rest. Uh, so there's not a good answer to that question, but I think that it will largely, when the time comes, and I do hope that the, the time will come sooner rather than later, that it will depend on the political momentum and the atmosphere in the EU, which will be the one to ultimately make that decision. It's not going to be us. I wish we were the ones to, to be able to decide on that. I think it will be the EU like it did until now in all the previous enlargements. 
it is a it is a definitely so far merit based process. It is just, just a practical reasons. It would be very difficult to synchronize six different countries to do the the synchronization of the of the negotiation process and to be prepared at the same time. So Montenegro is a front runner. You know, definitely we are supporting a merit based. Uh, yeah, I would conclude with. Um all the, what my, my ambassadors said was that uh, we married to be in EU. We're part of Europe and we have to be part of the EU family. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, maybe the next question for one person because otherwise we <laughs> don't have a, a room for a lot of questions. Is there somebody with an urgent question? I see somebody at the front row here. Yeah. I would just like to pick, on something, pick up on something that you said, which is that the EU seems to have a marketing problem. And I, I, maybe it's, I don't want to quote you wrongly on this, but if you would agree on like this marketing problem, do you experience, and I'm asking this to any of you, whoever wants to answer, you don't have to answer on behalf of the whole block. Um, do you agree that there is a marketing problem and, uh, on uh, for, from the European side of things? And if so... Um, what is the risk of e the EU not explaining itself well enough for your country? Yeah, but maybe uh, uh, because I know you, Simon, I, I'm going to ask which country do you want to ask it to? <laughs> Let me ask it to the gentleman maybe from Kosovo. Yeah. Actually, uh, the EU does a lot of EU marketing efforts in our region. For example, the message of the EU is very well understood in Kosovo. That's the reason why when we ask people about to pronounce themselves about the EU, it's always more than 90% of people that are pro-EU pro -EU policies and uh, take that matter very seriously, even in elections. Uh, there are some countries that have been spoiled and uh, that has been done not with an inner reason, but with a perspective that uh, this concept of spoiling contribute to the geopolitical position of the particular country. And probably I think that this uh, should change. The EU should communicate this message. If 90% of the, of the economy of a certain country is based with the EU, then it should be no doubt that the EU should be the first choice of any of the political parties in that country. Yeah, there was a question there. Um, Jolien? Yeah, this guy with the... Uh, yeah, I have a, qu a question relating to the EU expansion, because in my experience, what I've noticed a lot in the Western Balkans, Southeastern European, however you want to put it, um, is a sense of bitterness also by the fact that Romania and Bulgaria managed to join in 2007, and there have been very cynical opinions about the fact that Romania and Bulgaria purely joined because of geopolitical reasons to basically close off and contain the Western Balkans. And, well, how do you explain this? Because if you look at how, how it was at the time, how were they able to join in comparison, well, and the Western Balkans couldn't? This. I think he's looking better at you, Walter. <laughs> Well, uh, um, please. Uh, uh, if Maybe you can start and they can add, add or something. Yeah. To. Well, I think that it's certainly true that the conditions to become a member of the EU have become stricter over the years. In a way, the EU is a bit of a moving target, not only because there's new uh, legislation every year and, and this becomes part of the, of the, of the acquis and the things that the countries need to align with. Um, but at the same time, um, maybe... Uh, the experience of this, this enlargement round of 2004, 2007, the Big Bang enlargement round, as we call it, and this sort of also rule of law deterioration as one of the, well, at least of one of the developments that we saw in the years after in some, some member states has made, uh, I think for the Netherlands in any case, and for some other member states as well, has made them realize, okay, with this enlargement round for the Western Balkans, we need to be uh, extra uh, strict on these criteria. Um, so, in a way, uh, the process has become more strict, and it's it's hard to explain that. I, I'm not fully sure whether we can say that Romania and Bulgaria have only joined for geopolitical reasons for fencing off the the Western Balkans region from from uh, countries uh, further to to the east or the northeast. Um, so. Uh, 
I, I guess it would be, go a bit too far to, to make that statement, but indeed it has become uh, more difficult and that is something that, uh, yeah, of course impacts also upon the credibility of the process because the EU is not, not perfect itself. Does any one of you want to add something? No, it's clear? Okay. Is there one last, maybe urgent question that you, yeah. Uh, oh, I see a lot of them. Okay, uh, pick one, Jolie. <laughs> I see on the right side a lot of hands. Maybe this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think maybe it's interesting to introduce myself because I'm a perfect mixture of the entire region. So my mom is from Bosnia, from Zavidovici. Uh, I have a Montenegrin descent. I'm Filipovic. I'm Serbian by my nation. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, like a perfect mixture. And I think. Um, born in 1993 during wars. <laughs> so I think that Europe in general is very close to people of my generation. Uh, also uh, in an educational sense, mm -hmm. a fee for university, for a Dutch university is 22,000 euros for me. And for my boyfriend who is Dutch is 2,000. How can I then come to the West pick up maybe some good habits or maybe a way of thinking and send it back to Serbia if I need to pay 10,000, um, 10 times more. So yeah, my question is, are there any ways how you can maybe include my generation, um, open-minded Serbs, open-minded Balkans into integration? We are really a key, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, difficult question to answer, maybe. I'm looking here around the table. I could start maybe again. Walter? Yeah. <laughs> no, but you're touching upon a very key point, and that's that the countries have now been in this sort of waiting room for, for 20 years, whereas um, it would be better to try and um, engage them as much as possible already with um, and, and integrate them into policy making already while becoming a part of a full member of the EU. Uh, How many rooms is, is there for this kind of thing? So without a fully membership already have economic or educational, what she said? Well, I think educational uh, uh, exchanges is an example where, where there should be quite some room yeah. because it doesn't depend necessarily on, on certain criteria where you can have student exchanges between, between countries. And um, I think like a step of like full internal market integration before you become a member that's difficult because you almost would need the same criteria but um, yeah, this sort of waiting room model in some ways we maybe we need to try and, and change that a little bit and um, this should be then a realization in Brussels amongst policymakers in the EU capitals that um, that the solutions sometimes are also in the Western Balkans and that you do need to reach out when it comes to all these issues that we've touched upon uh, tonight. So. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think uh, uh, we have a, a third round at the bar with music and drinks and uh, bites and everything. So uh, I think that we keep the, qu the last questions uh, for this, uh, for at the bar. But uh, at first I would like to go to Thijs Reuten because um, he will close off this evening, uh, and he's been writing a lot. So I'm very curious what you uh, take along uh, from this program. Uh, Julien, uh, maybe you can give him the microphone. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, th thank you very much. Thank you for excellent moderation, and um, thank you all for coming. Uh, the objective of what we organized, wanted to organize tonight, is not to have a discussion with politicians, so I'm the only politician uh, that actually is closing the event. Uh, we wanted to organize something to get the debate at another level in the Netherlands, to inform people, to get people interested that maybe know already a lot about it or people who do not know a lot about it. I hope it worked. I hope it worked for you. I hope that maybe if you do not follow the region as closely as I do or some of us do, um, that you will look with different eyes to the news, to the newspapers, to the upcoming elections in Montenegro, for example, the second round in the 2nd of April, but also other news. I can also say that this is not the last event that I want to organize, that we want to organize also with, with different partners, because obviously we couldn't touch upon all countries today. Some countries have, have not been uh, discussed as much as others, but we will organize uh, more events, so keep uh, following our, our channels on that. I wanted to thank in particular 
he's offline now, but Nikola Dimitrov, who stepped in at the last uh, instance, replacing uh, Radmila Sekerinska. I think he was very lucid, very clear and very sharp in his analysis, touching upon some points that we also um, addressed uh, later on. I think that, um, uh, of course, many interesting points have been made, but I also particularly myself liked the element of going back into the history, our shared history, history that is part of our European history. That was unexpectedly, because I was not in control of uh, the whole program at all. Uh, also for me, a great connection uh, to make and to take with me back also to my work in, in Brussels in the European uh, Parliament, because I think ultimately that points also to the element that um, it is not uh, some faraway region that we are talking about. And I want to take an element from the speed dating, because you told me, uh, Ambassador from North Macedonia, that she spoke with one of the guests uh, and that she asked him, oh, you have been to North Macedonia, did you feel in Europe or did you feel in some exotic place? And this, it, I think he was rather young, eh, the gentleman that said it, but, but he said, of course, of course it was Europe. Eh? It felt like Europe. And that is also, if you haven't been to the region uh, as many times uh, or, or, or maybe not at all, please go and visit. And I want to end also with the element of the education. And that brings me also to a potential solution that we are also working on in the European Union, because we cannot, we cannot leave processes uh, like they are. And giving the countries, giving the people, the young people of the respective countries the chance ahead of possible membership to, to get to know the region, but also then to go back and help their country forward. And a good example uh, also from one of the countries that I've seen is to, to give your uh, young people the possibility to study on the condition that you also come back and work for a couple of years on the future of your own country. These kind of, of, of arrangements, but also a more open attitude from the European Union to already start giving concrete benefits of being part of Europe, European Union, before membership, that is helping two ways, because it helps to get the people enthusiastic, to get, keep the governments focused, because we need to keep working on it, but it also helps to fight uh, this fatigue that has been uh, mentioned, the fatigue uh, of the, leng the, lengthy, uh, the lengthy process. And another thing that it does, it is links the countries more strongly to the European Union. You know, maybe if you have followed me in my activities in the European Parliament, that I'm a strong proponent of membership of all the countries, but we need to do it together. We cannot do it in a, in a big bang. I always say also in Brussels, there's no such thing as a fast track uh, road to the membership, but there is a way of doing your homework very fast. And as I also say, my son, I cannot do his exam, I cannot do his homework, but I can help him to do it. And that is my last political message. Uh, because his name was mentioned, the Prime Minister of this country, and, uh, but it's actually a message to all the other uh, 26, uh, including the Netherlands, the 27 countries. We need to engage much more, much more in giving them, giving these countries the feeling that we also want it. It's not just a thing that we kindly grant them when they completed the whole process. We have to show and demonstrate that we also want it. Is it gonna be easy? No, it's not gonna be easy, but we need to show that we also want it like we did uh, in the past. And then I'm convinced that we will make it, that it will be a win-win situation. And I hope to see many of you at future events. Thanks to the organizers, thanks to the team of the Bali, thanks to my team, Jelle, Roos, Sanne, uh, Fritz and, and Jeff who are uh, here, uh, but um, I, Especially thanks to uh, all our guests and to you, the audience, for coming. Thank you. Uh, there's music, there are drinks, uh, what I said, so uh, please, uh, I would say, go to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>